Well, thank you for that uh, very gracious introduction. What I'd like to talk about is how I see medicine really fundamentally being changed in the next uh, 10 years or so. And the essence of what I see in that change is that healthcare is really in the future going to be have two major components. One, a wellness component, which just doesn't exist today. And two, uh, a disease component, which does exist today, but we're doing it all wrong. And the wellness component provides the correct way to be able to deal with disease. So we'll talk about all of these things uh, as we move forward. So imagine just for a moment that we could do these five things. Suppose that we could actually quantify from your blood uh, your wellness. Suppose that we could use those metrics to help begin optimizing your wellness. And I'll tell you unequivocally, most of you think you're well, you can be much better than you are right now. Suppose that we could actually follow wellness to disease transitions and look at the earliest point of disease transition. That really is the way to understand disease and ultimately to transmit uh, people back to, to health. I think over the next 10 to 15 years, we'll create a wellness industry that will far exceed the disease industry. And that is going to give us significant opportunities for fundamentally changing medicine in many different uh, directions. And, and suppose in time we could actually democratize this whole vision of wellness and send it out to the developing as well as the developed world, that is, to fundamentally change for the world how people are treated with regard to health care. So let's, uh, what I'm going to do now is give you kind of a personal sketch of uh, the last 45 years of my career, starting at 1970 at Caltech and how I've uh, come to this particular point of view. And when I was a young assistant professor at Caltech, uh, the, the real challenge for biology and medicine was deciphering complexity. And, you know, the issue is like the blind man and the elephant. You know, each of the blind men feeling a different part of the element felt, elephant felt that he had the essence of the elephant. And of course, the real lesson here is what a systems approach would do is integrate all those different observations and more and give you a global and a holistic picture. And in thinking about complexity at this point in time, we didn't have the conceptual framework for thinking about it, nor did we have technologies or, uh, or uh, strategies for being able to deal with it. And it was, uh, as I said earlier when I gave a, a talk, uh, in 1973 that I read this book by Thomas Kuhn on the structure of scientific revolution that talked about paradigm changes and how hard they are to affect how fundamentally they can alter uh, our picture of a particular science. In this case, it was, uh, it was physics. And it was with that in mind that, that I had the good fortune to participate in a series of paradigm changes in biology over 45 years. All of them dealt with complexity in one way or another, and they led irrevocably to a whole new view of medicine. And that's really what this uh, talk is all about. So bringing engineering to biology over the years, we developed six instruments that allowed you to basically read and write uh, DNA and proteins. And, and this gave us high throughput biology and big data, two fundamental components to contemporary medicine. The Human Genome Project I got involved with because one of these, the automated sequencer, was central to that. And not only did I develop the instrument that enabled it, but we played a role in sequencing human genes. And of course, from a systems point of view, what that gave us was a complete parts list of human genes and by inference proteins, a really important component for biology. 
the automated sequencer required bringing together computer science and chemistry especially, uh, 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 some, some physics, some biology, uh, and some computer science. And it was there that I realized that it would be wonderful to have biology departments that brought all of those flavors of scientists together uh, and enabled leading edge biology to drive the kind of technology and analytic tools that it needed. And we did that at the uh, University of Washington in 1992 and had an incredibly successful department. And then in 2000, uh, I realized that um, systems biology really required a whole series of changes from how biology had been done in the past. And the bureaucracy of big state universities weren't very compatible with the kind of changes that were necessary. So I resigned and started the Institute of Systems Biology in 2000, and that's really focused on, on bringing system science to the fore. And about uh, 12 years ago, we really started focusing on a systems approach to disease, and that led to the uh, systems medicine and the emergence of this thing we call P4 medicine, which I'll, I'll talk about in some detail, because it holds the descriptive key to where medicine is going in the future. So let's talk a little bit about systems medicine and what its fundamental properties are as I see it now. So one is this idea that each one of you as a patient or as an individual is going to be surrounded by a virtual cloud of billions of data points. They'll be very heterogeneous and in nature, we'll be able to integrate and model these points so we can optimize wellness and minimize disease. And I'll show you that at the end of this lecture. We already can create these data clouds. We can look at how they dynamically change and we can extrapolate uh, and optimize wellness from that. One of the big challenges here is uh, signal to noise challenge. And it's the reason that a lot of institutes like Google have failed repeatedly in biology because biology is all about signal to noise. A lot of the noise is biological noise. And if you don't have the domain expertise to deal with it, you aren't going to get very far. So domain expertise is absolutely critical. One way to take diverse data like this and make it useful is to create biological networks that operate at the level of chromosomes, molecules, cells, uh, organs, uh, and even individuals. Uh, and they're seamlessly integrated then to essentially carry out uh, the biological networks, carry out fundamental uh, operations in biology development physiologic response, aging, and of course, if you get sick, the networks can become disease perturbed. And if we can identify the differences between normal and disease perturbed networks, that not only gives us fundamental insights into biological mechanisms, but it gives us new insights into early diagnostic and therapeutic approaches to disease. So one of the questions you might ask that is really interesting is why does a small institute like ours, uh, the Institute for Systems Biology, feel they're uniquely positioned uh, to transform medicine? And, and here I'd like to talk about the strategic importance of uh, sociologically of strategic partnerships and creating the resources to do daring kinds of new things. So uh, ISB, uh, as you've heard, kind of uh, articulated the vision of systems biology and later of P4 medicine. And then in 2008, I had the good fortune to get to know uh, the Minister of uh, Finance in Luxembourg, who was thinking about a transformation to move them from a 90% de uh, de uh, dependence on financial services to bringing in biotech and healthcare. So we made a proposal to them. We did a bunch of things for them. 
what they did for us was to give us 100 million over five years, and we use that at 20 million a year to create strategies and technologies for P4 medicine. It gave us the resources to take on very big ideas, and it gave us the resources to take on daring ideas that never would have been funded by NIH or NSF. So what it left us with was a, at a tipping point in systems medicine. And I'll give you a couple of examples and show you what these are all about in just a moment. One of the questions we had is how we bring this new medicine to the healthcare system. So uh, a couple of years ago, I proposed a pilot project a longitudinal study on 100,000 well people, and we've already initiated the first part of that and had really spectacular results. We'll talk about that in just a moment. And of course, what happened very fortuitously with the uh, President's State of the Union address is he proposed uh, precision or personalized medicine as a big initiative, and this is an endeavor that follows beautifully into the initiative of precision medicine. So we even have hopes that it, uh, the challenging possibility can be funded. So there are a whole list of things that came, strategies that came out of uh, the, the Luxembourg endeavor. But uh, I'll tell you uh, just about one, which I think is really important. We, um, we have turned blood into a window that easily lets us distinguish health from disease. The problem in doing that is if you look at normals and disease, you'll see an enormous number of differences between the two. And 99 plus percent of them are noise. So how do you extract the signals? So we've developed a whole series of ways of extracting signals. And to give you uh, one of the recent examples of what we've done, we now have the ability to distinguish benign lung nodules from their neoplastic counterparts with unerring accuracy. And this ability to identify the benign nodules prevents surgery being carried out on many of these people, and it saves the US healthcare system north of $3.5 billion a year. So it's really a striking uh, uh, advancement. And this test has been advanced through Integrated Diagnostics, a company we set up about four years ago. And it's doing uh, incredibly well. And it's doing well because the payers recognize they're going to save an enormous amount of money. So that's one example of a strategy that we've, uh, we've developed. But these are the things that led us to this tipping point that I talked about. And bringing systems together, medicine together with uh, uh, big data and its analytics, and with consumer-driven social networks, the three of those converge to, to create a medicine that is predictive and preventive and personalized and participatory, the so-called 4P medicine. And those four Ps describe precisely the nature of the medicine that we're going to be dealing with. And it is focused on the individual. But let me show you how P4 medicine differs from contemporary medicine, because it is really striking. One, it's proactive rather than reactive. Two, it's focused on individuals and not on populations. Three, it's all about wellness uh, as a principal focus and not just on disease. And four, it's all about generating these uh, data clouds that I talked about that are dynamical in nature that give us the ability to optimize wellness and avoid disease. And four, this is really important, it recognizes the utter inadequacy of current clinical trials. Where you'll, for example, take 30,000 patients, you'll give them a placebo or a cancer drug, and you'll record the responses as curves from which you can read off, one, how the average population acts, and two, whether the drug is successful by some criteria or not. And what we would argue is that each of those 30,000 patients are unique genetically and unique environmentally, and you have no business averaging their data whatsoever. 
So what you do in P4 medicine is you take each of those 30,000 patients, you analyze their dynamical data clouds, and then you cluster them based on their own unique individual properties according to features you're interested in. Do they respond to a cancer drug? Do, are, they, uh, uh, are, are they resistant to the cancer drug or whatever you, you have? What I would also argue is NF1 studies on individual patients are going to be incredibly informative. And there's an enormous statistical arrogance out there. Unless you have the proper power, you can't say anything about anything. Isn't true at all. So, uh, and we'll have to invent new statistics to do some of these new kinds of things. And the final point, why are uh, patient-driven social networks a real key? Well, they're the key to patients and consumers learning about this new medicine. They provide the opportunity to do crowdsourcing where clusters of patients can actually optimize their wellness in ways physicians had never thought about. And I think ultimately they're going to be really important as advocates for changing the healthcare system, which is conservative, and physicians in particular are quite conservative about changes uh, in medicine. So really P4 medicine is about these two things, uh, quantifying wellness, about demystifying disease. I'll say that 98% of society's resources go into the disease side of this equation. I'll say that, that wellness has a questionable reputation because there are a lot of uh, hacks that are involved in this. The key thing is to create metrics that will allow us to measure wellness in a quantitative fashion, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. What I would also say is I see two industries emerging over the next 10 to 15 years, a wellness industry and a disease industry, and I'd say two things. One, I think the wellness industry will far exceed in market cap the disease industry, and it's exciting. We're creating the companies uh, now that will be the Googles and the Microsofts of the wellness industry. And number two, the wellness industry, in a way, is the real key to the disease industry in the future because it's only by following wellness to disease transitions we can look at the earliest origins of disease. And I'll say more about that in just a moment. But if there's uh, anything that really argues that wellness is really important, it's this interesting statistic showing how the average uh, lifespan has increased over the last uh, 10 to 15 years. And if it extrapolates on into the future, we can, we can expect half of the kids born this year to live to be 100. And the question for you is, what are the last 30 years of their life going to be like? Are they going to be physically debilitated and maybe even more so mentally, or will they be alert and functional up to the end? And that's where I think wellness is really important. So as I said, we originally proposed a few years ago uh, a wellness study which eventually would move to 100,000 individuals over an extended period of time. And what we've done in the past 10 months is studied 107 individuals uh, with a wellness project uh, similar in structure to what we propose with the long, uh, longer uh, study. So let me begin by talking kind of conceptually about what the study is. So we plan to do your whole genome sequence, and then every three months we'll take detailed uh, blood and saliva urine samples and do clinical chemistries, metabolites, proteomics, a variety of other things. Every three months we'll do your gut metabolome, which gives you the ratio of different microbes present in your gut. This is absolutely critical to health, as we're coming to learn. And then we're doing uh, self-tracking with uh, uh, Fitbit that measures activity, uh, monitoring sleep, uh, weight, blood pressure, uh, and the like. So what we can say is if you started with a large cadre of individuals, you could in time 
look back and say that a subset of them either maintained the wellness they exhibited when they said they were well, or even exceeded uh, that wellness, exceeded in health. And what is interesting about that group of people is, one, we can mine their data for the metrics that will make a wellness metric available for us. And preliminary analyses of several data sets suggest there are some really exciting possibilities for doing this. And it turns out that metric is really important because you operationally can think of each of us having right beside us a wellness well. And even though you think you're well, most people are right down at the bottom of that wellness well. What these data will give us is the ability through integration and modeling for each individual to identify actionable possibilities that can bring you up uh, the level of that well, hopefully to a uh, maximum uh, potential, a maximum capital for the individuals. And of course, the depth of the well and how difficult this is going to be is uniquely uh, uh, determined for each individual. And a lot of that will be determined genetically, but we'll be able to deal with, uh, with many of the limitations. The other thing we can do uh, with this look back from a certain point of view is identify the point at which uh, a particular disease transition occurred by taking the data tranches back to that earliest transition point. And we can look at the networks that exist there, uh, disease perturbed in nature, and create the early diagnostics and therapeutics that could move you from the disease back to the wellness trajectory, saving all of the healthcare costs that are associated with the disease that extended on. And that's an enormous uh, amount of savings. And of course, with these actionable traits, they can come from individual types of data, and I'll give you some examples of that. But what is really interesting is if you integrate two or more of these different types of data, they start to reveal completely new actionable possibilities. We take the actionable possibilities and bring them back to the individuals with a coach. The coach explains not only what the actionable possibility is, but psychologically persuades the individual in the context of what their own vision of their health is uh, to act on these actionable possibilities. And we have MDs that, that uh, advise uh, the coaches and so forth. And what is the most positive reinforcing immediate gratification is for an individual to make an actionable act and then see in the next tranche of his data cloud that it has changed in exactly the predicted way to optimize your wellness. And we've seen this happen uh, repeatedly. We're going to scale this up. We've started with uh, 107 individuals this first year. The next year, we're going to do probably somewhere between 1,000 and 5,000, uh, and then after that, we'll scale up by an order of magnitude, finally to getting to 100,000 or more. And I'm going to talk right at the end of the lecture about two different ways uh, we can carry out this uh, scaling up and so forth. But what I'll talk about now is this study we started in March, where we did uh, all of these data types uh, every three months on 107 uh, different individuals, and I'll give you some of the stories that we got from these uh, individuals, starting uh, first of all with actionable possibilities from single data types. So 91% of the individuals had beautiful nutrient abnormalities that came from clinical chemistries. We had a beautiful inflammatory panel that revealed 68% had some limitations there, and the same was true for cardiovascular, and diabetes. And in fact, to be specific, let me give you examples. So a beautiful wellness to disease transition was a disease called hemochromatosis. This is caused by um, two defective copies of a particular gene, and that defect 
leads to an enormous elevation of iron in the blood level. And what elevated iron does to you is first attacks your pancreas, then it attacks your liver, and finally it attacks your heart, leading to decompensation. Usually it's the heart symptoms that bring them in to the physician, and what's unfortunate is by that time they're already a chronic invalid. So in the 107, we had two homozygous individuals for this disease, and we were able to carry out a really simple, actionable possibility. None of them had uh, pancreatic liver or heart damage, uh, the young men, basically. And all you have to do is bleed them regularly once a month until you bring the levels down to normal, and then you can bleed them at a regular level consistent with keeping the levels down. But it's absolutely a straightforward kind of thing. This is a horrible, expensive chronic disease. So just with those two individuals alone, we've been able to see really striking differences. Now, what was really interesting about the study is we found 12 people that had one copy of the gene, one bad copy of the gene. And typically, these are viewed as normal individuals. But what was interesting is in the heterozygous uh, individuals, their iron levels were exactly halfway between the two that had the disease and the normal level. And I'll guarantee you, they'll get a disease that will just take much longer. So we're now doing N of 1 studies to begin uh, determining whether, in fact, that is true. We found seven individuals that were in frank pre-diabetic states. They're all 10 months after the study, completely normal and uh, in a reasonable state now. We found three individuals that had uh, high mercury from tuna. So where would you ever get high mercury? And there are two classic places. Two out of the three ate enormous amounts of tuna sushi, and they were able to bring their levels down very quickly by substituting uh, uh, salmon for tuna sushi. And the third individual got it from amalgam fillings. So if you have amalgam fillings, you ought to get them replaced with uh, some more modern kind of filling. And he's having all of his fillings replaced now. Uh, we had three individuals that had uh, quite high lead levels, one uh, a very young individual. And you wonder where that came from because lead in paints, lead in gas no longer exists. So, uh, but the fact is lead is really a toxic metal because you can only get it out of your body through chelating reagents. So uh, that one young individual we sent to his physician, he's now having uh, uh, chelation uh, bring the lead level down and so forth. Um, um, Knowledge of your genetic variants lets you both optimize your diet and exercise, and I won't get in this to say it is really useful to know about your diet and what you can take and what you can't take. Some people, carbohydrates are deadly for. Other people, fats are deadly for, and often, they're orthogonal. It's one or the other kind of thing. So you can design your diets according to the limitations your genes leave you with. Leave you with. And, and uh, genetic variants certainly predict potential for athletic injuries. In fact, because it's so popular, there are 600 variants that are associated with, for example, the tendency to have ACL tears. And what's interesting about a lot of these variants is you can do remedial things that almost guarantee you won't have the athletic injury if you know you're susceptible to that kind of uh, injury. And so let me show you uh, one of many, many examples we have now in uh, uh, integrating two different data types together in really interesting ways. So we found that 90 of 107 individuals had low vitamin D, and many of them had really low vitamin D. And vitamin D, as you can see there, is associated with a lot of things you don't want to be at risk for. 
And of course, you could say, well, it's Seattle. They never see the sun. Low vitamin D is normal. It's far more complicated than that because we've now identified, well, others have identified, we've identified in our population six variants from three genes that block vitamin D absorption, some rather severely. And to show you a really interesting experiment, we've been all 100 uh, individuals, and I've not got the most recent data here, but the curves look the same, for four or five alleles, for three risk alleles, or one or two alleles. And what you can see in the first tranche of data, which is the dark uh, lower level of vitamin C, is that the level of vitamin D for those three populations is inversely proportional to the number of risk alleles you have. What is interesting about this is if you want to bring individuals with four or five alleles up to a normal level of vitamin D, it takes mega doses of vitamin D to get there and to get by the blocks, which is not true for the individuals that have uh, just uh, a single uh, risk allele. So the level of minerals in your clinical chemistries itself in many cases is insufficient to really know how to deal with these uh, types of things. And we've moved almost all of the people from the red danger zone uh, into the green uh, acceptable zone. And what is interesting is those uh, few individuals that are still in the red zone fall into two categories. One, they haven't complied with the suggestions about taking more vitamin T, or two, something else that is going on that's really very interesting. And again, we can do N of 1 experiments to sort out uh, all of those uh, types of possibilities. So each of the 107 pioneers have multiple actionable possibilities, and these actionable possibilities change as their environment changes, and we've seen that reflected in several interesting uh, different ways. We had 80% compliance on actionable possibilities, a remarkable record. We had every one of the pioneers go all the way through the test, and almost all of them want to participate in the next set of studies. So that alone says that this has had an enormous impact on their life. And one of the most common statements is, I've never participated in anything which has changed my, so fundamentally, my view of health. And uh, many of them really feel enormously better than they did before. Again, all were, were healthy. So they've learned a couple of interesting things. One, your genome determines your potential, but not your destiny. You actually can control many deficiencies in your genome, not all, but many. And the second thing, which has really been striking, is individuals realize that in the future, they need to take responsibility for their own health. And the reason this is so interesting is I think this is one of the major foci that is going to bring the cost of health care down when we move from population treatments to individual treatments where the individual is responsible for optimizing uh, their own wealth. Opportunities, well, I would say there are a legion number. One, we're going to get a vast catalog of all the actionable possibilities, and it's going to make these studies really more effective in the future. We now have a graph database that has uh, 230,000 nodes and about 4.3 million edges, and those nodes and edges connect actionable possibilities with genetic variants with environmental signals. And you can use this beautifully to look at uh, the individual data clouds. Number two, we've used these and the appropriate analytics that we've developed to optimize wellness and avoid disease for individual patients. And we've shown you a whole series of uh, actionable possibilities. Number three, we already have a good handle on what uh, parameters are going to be useful metrics for wellness. And I think what is really exciting about it is if you d just define the metrics by increasing wellness, 
you can create a set of metrics that then can be deconvoluted to say which metrics are associated with physiologic wellness as opposed to which metrics are associated with psychological wellness. And I have a lot of reasons for believing we'll be able to do that. We're going to be able to look at these early disease mechanisms, transitions from wellness to disease, and in fact, back. And that's really going to transform how we think about uh, disease uh, in the future. We're going to be forced to develop better and better assays. And we want to be able, for example, to assay the immune system more effectively and a whole variety of other things that uh, I, I could talk about. The cells in the blood are marvelous windows into physiology in fascinating ways. And with um, high throughput single cell analysis, we're thinking about a lot of exciting things that can be done. But you know, ultimately, what you'd like to be able to do is take most of these assays and, and migrate them to a smartphone and be able at home to prick your finger and make most of the measurements that you're going to need. And I think that's going to happen in a 10 year. A lot of these things are on a Moore's law decline. I mean, DNA sequencing, my prediction is when third generation sequencing with uh, single molecule electronic detection comes into the four, uh, I predict in five to eight years we'll have a hundred dollar genome, an easy uh, assay for this kind of thing. Um, we'll have a database of wellness, we'll have a database of disease transitions, that's the fuel for innovation creating the new industries that we talked about before. And, and really what we're doing with this whole study is beginning to bring P4 medicine into the healthcare system with uh, an improvement in quality. We haven't really talked very much about that, but decreasing the cost, I gave you one example of that, and, and promoting innovation in healthcare. But what I would say is really uh, interesting are some of the social implications of this P4 medicine. One, it's going to lead to a digitalization of medicine, just as we talked about how we can digitalize the, uh, the assays. And we have to only think back to 1990 when whoever imagined a woman with a cell phone in a rural village in India could make a living for her family. That's the digitalization of communication. And I think the digitalization of medicine uh, is going to lead to a digitalization of healthcare for uh, individuals too. Innovation, the, the database that we're creating now, I think is going to be uh, an opportunity for many startups. And there are other efforts that are ongoing uh, in various ways, uh, similar to the program we've talked about here, and they too will create the data. Uh, wealth, I talked earlier about the wellness industry, seeing that of the disease industry in 10 to 15 years. And I think we're really going to drive an industry that will be, uh, could well be centered here in the United States, an important economic opportunity. We're pushing Congress with these kind of opportunities. I'd like to argue that this 100K program is absolutely equivalent to the human genome program, uh, only better in the promise of what it can deliver uh, in the future. Um, competition. Um, if you think about the Industrial Revolution, the, the machine that really transformed things was the steam engine. And what was interesting about the steam engine is it was a macro invention that threw off many, many micro inventions and led to this big revolution. I'd argue that the concepts of P4 medicine are a macro invention that is once again going to lead to many micro inventions and enormous uh, economic opportunities. I think uh, one key is this is really both through the digitalization of medicine and having individuals take responsibility for their own health, uh, going to begin to deal with the financial crisis that, uh, and I'll guarantee you, contemporary medicine and the way it's going has no chance of turning the cost around. And finally, this optimization of human capital is really interesting. Clearly, one of the enormous uh, trillion dollar costs to society is uh, sickness. 
And if you can optimize human capital, you can mostly avoid sickness. And, and sickness actually comes in two different categories. So about 20% of it is sickness where you don't go to the job because you feel so bad. 80% is you kind of go to the job, but you don't do anything while you're there. It's called presenteeism. And I think we can get rid of both of those aspects, as well as maximizing the wellness potential of each individual, that is, maximizing uh, the human capital. So we have two approaches to moving forward. One, we're continuing the 100,000 wellness person. It's uh, an academic endeavor. It's all about discovery science. It's about creating better assays and better integrative analytics, and we're seeking congressional funding again. I hope the Obama uh, initiative is, is going to be very exciting. One of the things we're doing here that's really going to be exciting is we're beginning to seek out populations of individuals that are uh, highly susceptible to disease. One population we're really going to look at that's going to be fascinating is one that's very susceptible to Alzheimer's disease. And we can categorize that now very beautifully in a number of ways. And what's interesting is if you can catch Alzheimer's at its earliest transition point, we now have the wherewithal to be able to delay its onset for 10 to 15 years. And that could well be to the time we have a cure. So we're collaborating with a group at UCLA, and we'll be doing this together with this uh, population of 200 individuals we'll look at that has uh, high susceptibility to Alzheimer's, and we're doing this with a whole variety of other diseases. The other opportunity is we've started a company to, called Wellness Science. It's going to be consumer-directed. We're still trying to figure out the details of how you do this effectively and, and who's going to pay for it and all of those kind of things, but these are the two different directions that we're really taking. But consumer wellness, digitalization of healthcare, I think really is going to democratize healthcare uh, for the world in the future. And whether that's a, a 10 year or 15 year period, we don't know. It is clearly a function of what resources end up going into this. So again, wellness, the opportunity. Uh, I think we are going to be able to quantify wellness as I've discussed here. I think we are going to be able to maximize your own human potential by optimizing your wellness. I think we'll be able to detect these transitions and fundamentally change how we deal with disease in major ways. Uh, I think we are going to create this uh, wellness industry and so forth and, and democratize the well approach for the developing as well as uh, the developed world. But, uh, there's a long way to go, but I think we have a really clear uh, forward path and largely what we're talking about depends on recruiting people who can help and resources to, to do things. I show this, my colleagues uh, Nathan Price and Sean Bell have been magnificent helping lead this project, but it's the most complicated scientific project I've ever done and this isn't even all of the people that have been involved. But on the other hand, the results, uh, as you've seen, have been spectacular. So I'd be glad to answer questions if there are questions or comments.